Welcome, friends, to Prophecies of Hope, brought to you by the Hope Channel and Amazing Facts. We are here again for another exciting episode in the Word of God, and we're glad that you're with us, tuned in to this amazing prophetic study, this amazing prophetic series. My name is Michael, here with my father today to begin another study. But before we begin, let's do our quiz over our last episode, The Unpardonable Sin. We invite you to follow along on a sheet of paper. Let's go to question number one, Father. Number one is a review. There are four primary functions of the Holy Spirit in working upon our hearts. Four things that the Holy Spirit does for us. Name two of them. The Holy Spirit does four things in our lives. Name two of them. And you should be able to do that with two words. And number two, true or false, one of the things we can do against the Holy Spirit is to resist His leading in our lives. Now number three, true or false, the Holy Spirit cannot remain in the life of someone who is willfully continuing to disobey the will of God. Number four, true or false, if we neglect to make a decision to obey Jesus or Bible truth, we have begun the process of committing the sin which God can never forgive. And now number five, is it true or false as well? The unpardonable sin is any sin that we continue to practice till we no longer hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Is that true or false? Well, let's review. Question number one, there are four primary things that the Holy Spirit does in our hearts, four things He does for us. Name two of them. Well, those four things, Son, were He teaches us, He guides us, He convicts us, and He unites us together. So if you got two of those, then you got number one. Number two, Son, one of the things we can do against the Holy Spirit is to resist His leading in our lives. That's also true. Then number three, the Holy Spirit cannot remain in the life of someone who is willfully continuing to disobey the will of God. The answer, son, is true, yes. Number four, if we neglect to make a decision to obey Jesus or Bible truth, we have begun the process of committing the sin which God can never forgive. That's true. The last question, the unpardonable sin, is any sin that we continue to practice Till we no longer hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the answer for that one is true also. So all of them were true except for the first one. You got two of the first ones, then you got 100% on your quiz. Number 29 is today's study, God's Washing Machine. And there is a free handout that you can download from our website revelationsofprophecy.com. Just click on the washing machine topic. You can download the handout we have for you there. So today, our study is going to be God's washing machine. We invite you to join us again for a word of prayer as we begin. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that we can once again turn our attention to the truths of your word. We ask that you would guide and direct our thoughts and you will inspire us by your Holy Spirit to make the decisions that you want us to make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God's washing machine. The first mechanical washing machine was actually invented all the way back in 1 AD by the Romans. It was sort of like a water-operated uh, thing. You can see here in the picture. That was the first mechanical washing machine. Before that, everybody washed by hand. And of course, even today, some people still wash by hand. Then in the year 1907, they made the first electric washing machine in America, as we can see here from the picture. Modern, modern day washing machines actually haven't changed very much in over a hundred years. Yes, all the way back to 1908 was when that first uh, washing machine with that first uh, style, we've kind of followed that same principle, that same design since then. Now, son, washing machines have gotten pretty sophisticated, haven't they? Yeah, now we have some very complex washing machines in our modern days, computerized and everything. 
and they're also very expensive. But that brings us to the question, son, does God have a washing machine? And the answer is yes. Let's begin reading from Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So here we can see the concept of a washing machine in Ephesians 5. Washing of water. You can also see baptism symbolized there. Let's continue. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So, son, can you give us an idea as we're beginning this study? What would be God's washing machine? Well, apparently the church is God's washing machine. And we're going to explain that as we continue our study today. Now that brings us to the question, why go to church? Why do people attend church, son? Well, of course, there are a variety of reasons people attend church. A lot of people today, one of the most common reasons people attend church today is simply to socialize. Church becomes a time to have a grand social get together often. Kind of like a club almost. Another reason people go to church is sort of habit. They've been going to church all their lives. This is some, something that you're supposed to do every week. They go on Sunday, or of course we've learned that the real day is Sabbath, Saturday, to go to church. Some people go faithfully on Saturday. And so they do this sort of out of habit. That's another reason why people go to church. And another reason is duty. Some people, they feel like they really need to go to church every week, even if they don't want to, so they attend. And there are others who actually have a church duty. Maybe they're the deacon or the deaconess or the usher or the, or the greeter or something. And so because of duty, they're there. If it weren't for the duty, maybe they wouldn't go. And, and then others simply go to the church to be entertained, to have a nice time with the music or the entertaining sermon or whatever. If the preacher is a good preacher, an entertaining speaker, then certainly that could be a reason to go to church. And then the final reason we have listed here it really is the only real reason to go to church, and that is to worship God. That ought to be the reason for you to go to church. And the question now for you is this, why do you go to church? Among those reasons we had listed, how about you? Why do you go to church? What is the purpose of attending church at all? Why attend? Well, there are five reasons to attend church, son, and we want to list these five reasons in our study today. The first reason we've already mentioned, it, number one, and that is to worship God. That's the real reason to go to church. Here's a text that you can put in your notes. Jeremiah 26, verse 2 says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to, to worship, worship in the Lord's house. So the reason we should go to church really sh is to worship God. But that brings us to the question, son, what does corporate worship include? Well, generally, it includes a period of Bible study, and then it would also include prayer and praise time, and also a giving sharing time where we can not only give our tithes and offerings, but also, we can share some of the things God's done for us. Those are the three reasons for corporate worship. Bible study, that happens in Sabbath school and should happen as well in the sermon. Then the opportunity for prayer, that could be group prayer, corporate prayer, and of course praise, that's done in music, and then giving. We give our tithes, our offerings, and we can give our praise as we share what God has done for us during the week. That's number one. We go to church to worship God. What's another reason? Another reason, number two, is for fellowship. Let's get a verse for this from 1 John 1, verse 3. It says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So we go to church to fellowship with one another, to edify one another as we 
converse about spiritual things. Reminds me, son, I had a lady come to me one time at the beginning of a Prophecies of Hope program. She said, what's the real reason why you're having these lectures? Like I had some evil motive. <laughs> and I thought of this verse. The reason why we have shared with you here on Prophecies of Hope, the Hope Channel, the reason is that you may choose to fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. In Acts 2 verse 47, we read about the example of the early church. We read, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. How were they added to the church, son? Let's find out from a few verses earlier, verses 41 and 42. Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Well, son, after they were added, added to the church through baptism, then did they faithfully attend church? Absolutely. Let's read on in verse 42. It says, They continued steadfastly, faithfully, regularly, in other words, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So after baptism, they continued attending church? They continued every week. I've often thought it's sort of like marriage. Imagine getting married and not planning to live together. What's the point? Exactly. And it's the same spiritually. What's the point in joining a church if you're not planning to attend the church? What's the point in getting baptized if you're not planning to faithfully attend church? That's part of the reason for going to church. Fellowship. But son, can't I just stay home and worship God at home alone? Well, we are supposed to be worshiping God at home alone every day of the week. That's personal devotions and time with the Word of God. But the Sabbath is a special day of rest and fellowship. That's why Leviticus 23.3 calls it a convocation. What's, what's that mean? That means to come together. So to truly keep the Sabbath, we have to... We have to come together. Convocation. Let's notice another text from the New Testament, Hebrews 10.25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. This sounds like public worship. Some people just stay home, worship God alone. Yes. Paul says don't do that. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So number two, fellowship. Now, son, we want to mention a couple things relating to fellowship here. Part of fellowship is food. So, for those of you who are longtime Seventh-day Adventists, we want to challenge you. Find somebody that's a new Adventist or a guest and invite them to your home for a meal, or perhaps Sabbath after the service or on Sunday. Part of fellowship is eating together. When we eat together, that's when you really make friends. Which brings me to the next part of fellowship. Friendship. When new people come in the church, son, what should we do? Should they be left to sit by themselves? Well, a lot of times when new people come into the church, they are left by themselves because, well, we already have our cliques and our friends and our groups, but that's not how it should be. We should reach out and we should make friends with those new people. So part of fellowship you can see is food and friendship. Make friends with those guests, those new members that come to your church. I'm speaking to those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists. You've been in the church a while. You want the new members, the guests, to feel like this is their family, to feel welcome. That is fellowship number two. Let's go into the third reason to go to church. We have five reasons. Number three is for instruction in the truth. Our text is Acts 11, 25 and 26, which says, Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and... They taught many people. Yes, and the disciples were first called, called Christians first in Antioch. Now, son, what do you think that Paul and Barnabas taught? They taught the truth. If the church you're going to is not teaching truth, then you have every good reason to ask yourself, should I continue attending church? Because if you go to a church that's teaching error long enough, what might happen? You might start to believe. 
And that is why God calls His people that are in Babylon to come out of Babylon, come out of religious confusion, and be a part of a commandment-keeping church. The third reason for regular church attendance is for instruction in the truth. Number four now is for spiritual growth. Number four for spiritual growth, Ephesians 4, 11 to 15. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why were these gifts given? Let's read on. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's why these gifts were given. What does it mean, edifying the body? That means to build up the body. The body is? The body is the church. Yes. So these gifts were given to the church to build up, to edify, to strengthen the church. So son, I suppose if I want to benefit from the gifts given to the church, where should I put myself? Well, at home on my sofa. <laughs> if I stay home on my sofa, am I going to benefit from the gifts? <laughs> no. Let's read on. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We'll come back to that verse in a moment. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So number four is? Number four is spiritual growth. Now son, does that mean that I should just go to church and just feed my soul, myself, my, uh, it's all about me? Well, that sounds a bit selfish. <laughs> if all I did was eat, and I did an exercise, what you would, would happen? You would grow. I would grow the wrong way. <laughs> and it's the same spiritually. If all I do is go to church to benefit myself, then I'm gonna get all, my arteries are gonna get all clogged up with the cholesterol of selfishness and self-pity. And I'll probably have a spiritual stroke or a spiritual heart attack and die spiritually. That's right. The church was organized for service. Its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. A church that is not working to carry the gospel to the world is dying or is fighting one another. Or it's dead. So as we go to church, we sing together, we pray together, we fellowship together, we're encouraged together. And as we work together, what happens? We grow. We grow spiritually. That's the purpose, another one of the purposes of attending church regularly. Let's go to the fifth reason. The fifth reason for regular church attendance is for safety. We're gonna go back to that text from Ephesians 4. This is, I believe, verse 14. That you henceforth, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The church provides me with the anchor of truth so that I'm not blown away by every wind of doctrine. Now, does that mean there's no winds of doctrine blowing in the church? Doesn't mean that. That's why we have to root our faith in the Word of God and know what it teaches. Exactly. But God puts us in the church for safety. Outside the church, there are dangers. The church is sort of likened to a sheepfold. Outside the fold, there are Wolves. Yes, there are dangers. That doesn't mean there aren't any, any problems inside. That even doesn't mean there might even be wolves inside the, the fold. But we let the shepherd deal with that. The fourth, fifth reason for regular, regularly attending church is for safety. There we have, son, five reasons for going to church. Number one, to worship God. Number two, for fellowship. Number three, for instruction in the truth. And number four, for spiritual growth. And number five, for safety. As we abide in the church, we abide in Christ. You can read about abiding in Christ, right? Let's read about it from John 15, verse four. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. So one of the ways we abide in Christ is through regular church attendance. Now, why is that, son? Well, in order for me to connect myself to the head, Jesus, I have to be connected with the body. Colossians 1.18 says that he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. So Christ is the? Christ is the head. Church is the? The body. 
Let's look at another text to see this. This is from Ephesians 5, 23. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So as my son mentioned, what happens when you disconnect a body part from the body? It dies. Uh, do you have any relatives that are missing any? Yeah, I do. I have a grandfather, the father of my mother. He is missing his finger. What happened? Well, when he was growing up in Germany, he and his brother were out chopping wood and his brother had him hold the wood while he chopped and he chopped off my grandfather's finger. So he went through life missing his finger for the rest of his life. Now, of course, today with our technology, if you get that body part quickly, can you sew it back on? You can sew it on. But if the body part stays separated from the body very long, what happens? It dies. And it's the same spiritually. In order to live and grow, we must remain connected to the body, the church. In almost every seminar that I've done, the live seminars, many of them anyway, I have people say to me, I, I want to I be baptized, but I don't want to join any church. I want to be connected with Christ, but I don't want to connect to any church. Well, that would be almost like these uh, fingers on my hand saying, we don't want to be connected to that old body, that hand. We just want to connect to the head. <laughs> you get these fingers connected to the head, how would that work? Yeah, it's useless. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. If I want to connect to Christ, that is the head. I have to connect to the body. The body, which is the, the church. Which is the church. And that's the point we want to mention here. In order to connect, to be connected to Christ the head, we must also be connected to the body, which is the tr church. Now it is true, there are some people that are not yet connected to the church. Does that mean, son, that if people are not in the church, they're lost? No, not necessarily. We can read in Romans 2, 14 to 16, it indicates even the Gentiles who don't know about God as yet, but they are doing by nature the things of the law, will be accepted by God. In the judgment, God accepts them. And what about people that can't come to church, son? Well, the church has a responsibility to reach out to those people, to minister to them. This would be people like maybe where they're shut up in the hospital or because they're an invalid, they can't come to church. The church should reach out to those people so that those people can still stay connected to the body, connected to the church. But mark this, God will not sustain a person spiritually who willfully separates from the church or refuses to unite with the church body. There may be some, perhaps in isolated confinement in prison, they've gotten converted. God will sustain them because they are cut off, separated. But when they come out of prison, what does God expect them to do? To join His church. To connect to the body. That's why we mentioned, in order to be connected to Christ the head, we must also be connected to the... Church, the body. Yes, son. Well, that brings us to the next question. Well, the next question is, does it really matter to God which church I attend? I mean, there's a lot of churches to pick from. Can I just pick any church I'd like to attend and attend it? Well, son, to answer that, we should ask another question. Does God have a true church on earth? Yes, he does. We've if he has a true church, then we would expect he would want us to join that one, right? That's right. And we know he has a true church. We've seen that in Prophecies of Hope. First Timothy 3.16 says, the apostle writes, if I tarry long that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. God, does God have a church? He has a church. Now, it's only one church because there is only one head. How many bodies can you connect to one head? Well, before we get to that, let me ask you this, son. If we were to add up a column of numbers, how many right answers are there? You only have one right answer. You sure? That's right. How many wrong answers? <laughs> there could be an infinite number. How many churches are there today? There's thousands of churches, more than 40,000, 42 plus thousand different churches. But we know there's only one true church. In fact, let's notice that here from Ephesians 4, 4 and 5. There is only one body and What's one... What's the body? The church. Okay. One spirit, even as ye are called, in one hope of your calling. 
one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We have one Lord and we have one body. Jesus is the head and the church is the body. So son, why can we know that there's only, how can we know there's only one true church, one body? There's only one head. How many bodies do you connect to one head? You can only connect one body to one head. Now we're going to explain a little bit more about this one body, one head in just a moment, but it is time for a break. So stay with us. We will be back. We are people and we love to get connected. We connect as families because of birth. We connect as friends because we click. And we connect as communities because we care. Seventh-day Adventists are people who connect in communities called congregations, which in turn connect to form conferences, who connect together to form unions, divisions, and the general conference. Why do we connect? It starts with a connection to the Creator who invites us on a spiritual journey. When we journey together, we can help each other along the way. This journey is a journey of a lifetime. And as we learn and grow, life becomes filled with meaning and purpose. Our greatest joy is in helping others along the way. Wherever you are on your journey, we believe that we have something to offer that can make your life more whole. So the next time you see a Seventh-day Adventist, remember, you're not looking at someone who stands alone. They are connected to a world church that has 18 million members gathered in 13 divisions comprised of 122 unions formed by 600 conferences serving in 140,000 congregations in 208 countries who worship in 924 languages, and they all want to connect with you. Again, friends, we welcome you back to Prophecies of Hope. Our topic we've been looking at is God's washing machine. We talked about the reasons for going to church. We've also been considering how we connect to the church, the body, in order to connect to Christ the head. And we were noticing this particular text from Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 5, which says there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And we mentioned the, the reason we know there's only one true church is because there's only one Lord, there's only one head. How many bodies do you connect to one head? Just one. A body with more than one head is what? <laughs> that's, that's a strange thing. That's a beast. <laughs> Remember the beasts we've looked at in prophecy that have several heads? A body that has no head is what? That's a dead body, a corpse. A corpse. Now, a body with more than one head, or would that be, yeah. Is there any such thing? No, uh, a head with head more, with than, more one than one body. body. That's what I was there thinking There is no of. such thing. Can't find that in the natural world or in the spiritual world. So since we know there's only one head, we know there can only be one true body, not 43,000 different bodies like there are in the Christian world today, but only one true body. And that you can see clearly here from Ephesians 4, 4 and 5, there is one body. In fact, son, even Jesus himself indicates that there is one true church. We're gonna go to John 10 here. John 10, 14 to 16. Let's read the words of Jesus. He said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 16 now. 16, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, 
and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. All right, let's define some things here. The good shepherd, who's that? That's Jesus. The sheep, who's that? That's us. That would be the faithful follower of Christ. We trust that's you, our viewers. Well, since Jesus is the shepherd, his followers are the sheep, what's the fold? Must be the church. And notice that Jesus said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. They're not of this church. Well, where are they then? Well, they're perhaps in some other fold, a false fold, a false church, or lost somewhere in the world or in some other religion. And what does Jesus say? He says, I will bring them. I must bring them. He's going to bring them to where? To his one fold. To the one true church. If you are one of Jesus' sheep, then in his providence, he's guiding you to that one true fold, that one true church. And you can read in Ezekiel 34, verse 6, that the true shepherd is going to search out the lost sheep. Actually, it says that his sheep are scattered all over the world. This is the Old Testament parallel to, the, to the, what we're looking at in John 10. Ezekiel 30, 34, 6, the sheep are scattered all over the world. And then, verses 11 and 12, he will seek out his own sheep. And when he finds them, son, what's he going to do? He will bring them to his fold. You can read in verse 16 how he says, I will bring them again. Bring them to where? To his fold. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. So if you are one of Jesus' sheep, then in his divine providence, he is guiding you, maybe even through the hope, prophecies of hope meetings you've been listening to. He's guiding you to that one true fold, that one true church. I remember hearing somebody tell me one time, son, man told me, he said, I don't like to think about myself as a sheep. To be led around and told where to go, what church to attend. <laughs> And I thought to myself, I wonder who was the originator of that attitude. That sounds a lot like the attitude of Lucifer in heaven. Lucifer said, I don't want anybody to lead me around, tell me where to go and what to do. I want absolute freedom. And God gave Lucifer freedom, right? That's right. That's why we're in the mess we're in now. And he gives us freedom. But he says to us, if you really want to be happy, if you want true freedom, then follow me. Surrender your life to me. It's, but if you surrender, then that involves a commitment, a commitment, right? Yes, it's kind of like marriage. Does marriage involve a commitment, Father? Yes, indeed. Marriage involves a commitment. Uh, let's just illustrate this way. Let's imagine we're at the wedding of John and Sue. And as they're standing there about to take the vows, John leans over to Sue and he says, Now, I want to make something very clear to you, Sue. I don't plan to spend every day with you. <laughs> I don't plan to spend every night with you. I got to have my freedom. Well, if Sue has any sense at all, what's she going to say to John? Until you're ready to submit, to commit your life to me 100%, forsaking all others, I won't marry you. Oh, Smart woman. Yeah, <laughs> and it's the same with Jesus. We have to be willing to commit our, our lives to him 100%. And the only reason to do that is what? The only reason to do it is because you love him. There's John 14, 15. Exactly. There's only one reason to be a part of his church on earth, to unite yourself to his fold on earth, and that's because you love the Good Shepherd. When you love Jesus, you want to be a part of his fold. Well, son, which is the true church? Has God left us to wonder which fold we should join? No, we've seen here in our Prophecies of Hope series that God does have a true church today that lines up with the Bible identifying marks. We found eight of them in our seminar. And this church that God has is the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is an organized church like your body is an organized body. Let's review those eight points, son. It teaches the truth. We would expect that it would teach the truth to be the true church. Comes up after 1798. We got that from Revelation 12. It would be like the original, looking for Christ's coming, the advent. Baptizing by immersion. Because that's how the original church baptized, keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Teaching that death is like a sleep. Like the original called the remnant in the Bible. 
And then number four, it would be keeping the commandments. How many? All ten. To earn salvation? Never. Because no. they love Jesus. And then? Number five, it would have the spirit of prophecy. We've seen that represents the writings of Ellen White. We had a whole lecture on that. Number six, it would be a worldwide church carrying the gospel to the whole world. Number seven, it would have the three angels' messages, Revelation 14, 6 through 12. And number eight, it would be teaching people to take care of their health. And as my son Michael mentioned, there is only one church today that meets all eight of these points, and that is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. An organized church? An organized church. Is that to control your conscience? No, not organized to control people's conscience, but organized to spread the gospel to all the world. Some people have the idea that the true church is just scattered people here and there. Uh, that would sort of be like, imagine if I had my uh, part of my body here on Luzon, I had a leg in Mindanao, I had another leg on uh, the Panay Island, I had a, one of my arms in Bacolod, and mm -hmm. I could be spread all over the Philippi Philippines. Wouldn't that be great? That would be death. Some people have the idea the church is that way. Your body is connected. So the church is a connected body. Not connected, organized to control your conscience, but to give guidance in taking the gospel to the whole world. And my friend Jesus wants you to be a part of his family, his fold on earth. Let's go back now to John 10. We're gonna read verses 27, four and 16, if you're taking notes. All right, let's read it. John 10, 27, it says, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. What's the point here? The point is that Jesus, true sheep, they will hear his voice, they will follow him. Verse four now. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Note that, they know his voice. Now verse 16. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now son, isn't this kind of a comfort to a preacher, a pastor, an evangelist? It is. The assurance that my sheep will hear my voice. Because you see the work of preaching the gospel is a work of joy and a work of sorrow, right? Right. There's the joy of seeing people respond to the call of God, give themselves to Christ, surrender all to Him, make changes in their lives. But then there's the sorrow of seeing people turn away and say, no, not now. And we often feel both the joy and the sorrow. That's just the work of preaching the gospel. But the consolation that comes to every pastor, every evangelist, every gospel worker is this. My sheep will hear my voice. Now, son, tell us who decides whether a person is God's sheep or not. We do. We decide whether we are one of his sheep or not. God doesn't predestinate some people to be saved and some people to be lost. We have the choice to make. That's not something that God decides. You decide. When you surrender your life to God, then you are choosing to be one of his followers, which means you're choosing to be one of his sheep. Now the question for you today is this. Have you heard the voice of the Good Shepherd? If you're one of his sheep, the assurance is you will hear his voice. Have you heard the voice of the Good Shepherd? Well, after picturing all the false churches that are called Babylon, Revelation chapter 17, Revelation 18, God makes a special call to his people in Babylon. Let's notice it again from Revelation 18, 4. God says to his people that are in Babylon, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. So God calls his people that are in Babylon to come out of Babylon. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin. And that is the call of the Good Shepherd to those of you who may be listening to this. And we are happy for those who have made a decision to come out of Babylon and be a part of a commandment-keeping church. God points his people to his true church, his bride on earth, the fold, the true fold, which we've looked at, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Is it a perfect church, Father? 
Yeah, when you come in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you might be disappointed. When you come in the fold, and this often happens, people look around the fold, they say, look at that, Pastor. There's a sick sheep in here. What is this, a sheep hospital? I thought this was a sanctuary for saints. And other people, they look around, they say, look at that, there's a dead sheep in here. What is this, a sheep graveyard? I thought this was the perfect place. Other people, they'd say, well, you know, I'm looking at that sheep and uh, I'm wondering, why are they eating that? I thought the sheep manual says you're not supposed to eat that. Look what that sheep is eating. <laughs> Some people say, look, Pastor, look what that sheep is wearing. I thought the sheep manual says you're not supposed to wear those things. Should you follow the sheep? No, you should follow the shepherd. Don't follow the sheep, follow the shepherd. In fact, there are a lot of sheep in the fold that are not following the shepherd. That's why you must not follow the example of others. You must follow the example of Jesus. The church is like a washing machine where God wants to clean you up, to clean up his people. Now, son, is it very, it would, be, would it be a pleasant experience to be in a washing machine? I don't think so. I've often thought what it would be like for the shirt that high-class shirt thinks so highly of itself, gets dirty. And so it's put in the washing machine and it's feeling the effects of the soap and the suds and the agitation. You know, some washing machines, you know, they're, they're turning this way for a little while, then they're turning the other way. And the shirt is feeling all this movement. And then the shirt finds itself all tangled up in a dirty pair of pants. And the shirt says, whew, how'd you get in here? I didn't know they put stuff like you in here. If you're in here, I'm not staying. So the shirt crawls out of the washing machine. What's the best thing for the shirt? Stay in the washing machine and get clean. Now, you know, son, in some washing machines, they have something in the middle of the washing machine that's... They have an agitator. Do churches have those? They do sometimes. <laughs> I guess every church has an agitator. And some churches have these dual action agitators. And it may not be a pleasant experience to be there in the church feeling all the agitation. But the best thing for you, friend, is to stay in the church. Let God clean you up. Stay in the washing machine, stay in the church, and let God clean you up. Now someday God himself is going to sort the laundry. He'll separate the followers of Jesus from all the hypocrites. And when he gets done sorting the laundry, son, I want to be on the clean pile. Me too. Have you heard about the separation of the sheep and the goats? Yes, you can read about the sep separation of the sheep and the goats. The shepherd, Jesus, is going to one day separate the sheep from the goats. What is the difference, Father, between the sheep and the goats? Well, we didn't raise sheep when I was growing up as a boy, but we did have goats. We had a small farm in America. And I well remember the characteristic of goats. We learned, I learned as a boy growing up, that the goat is the most stubborn, disobedient, independent, free-thinking animal of any animal on the, on the farm. The goats have the attitude, you know, you'd, put a, you'd tie up a goat, and the goat had one thought, how can I get loose? I'm going to chew through the rope, I'll pull up the stake, I want a freedom. You put a goat on one side of the fence, he's thinking, how can I get over the fence, under the fence, through the fence, around the fence? I want to be on the other side. You tell a goat, don't eat it, he's thinking, I'm going to taste it. <laughs> Sometimes the goats would try to eat the clothes hanging on the clothesline. You tell a goat, don't get up on that, he thinks, I'm going to try. And not only that, son, I learned as a boy that the goats, they like to butt. I got butted a number of times as a boy. And I've often said the way you can spot a goat in the church is this way. Goats have the attitude, yeah, I know that's what God's Word says, but. I know that's what I'm supposed to do, but. I was thinking, yeah, that's the goat. If God says it, no ifs, ands, or buts. Let's do it. Amen. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. You don't want to be a goat. Now, the good news is goats can be converted, right? That's right. It's called conversion. Goats can be changed into sheep when they receive a new heart. Sheep can become goats when they start rebelling against God's leading. 
the good news, goats can become sheep when they surrender to God's leading. Let's go back to John 10, son, and notice the assurance for those who follow Jesus. Don't follow the sheep. You might end up following a goat. So let's read John 10, 27. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's an assurance. Yes, and my Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So we have the assurance if we are following Jesus and surrender to Him that we have, we are in His hand, we are in the Father's hand, and we are safe. No one can take you out of God's hand, out of Jesus' hand, except... Except us. Except you. By our freedom of choice. You can choose to become a goat, to not follow Jesus. Or as long as you follow Him, as long as you faithfully follow Jesus, you're safe. You're in His hands. You're in the Father's hands. Notice the promise from Paul, Romans 8, 38 and 39. This is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. Let's read it. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we have the assurance we are safe as long as we are following Jesus. The Bible says, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Today we want to speak for a moment to those of you who are watching who are not yet Seventh-day Adventists. God in His providence has brought the truth to you. Jesus the Good Shepherd wants you to be one of His sheep in His fold, in His true church. Why not say yes, following this, the Good Shepherd? We would invite you to contact the Hope Channel. They will put you in touch with a local Seventh-day Adventist church near you where you can be a part of God's true church, His fold, Christ's fold, at end time. Why not contact the Hope Channel? They'll put you in touch with a church like that. And I'll remember, you're always welcome to attend a Seventh-day Adventist church. Even if you're not a member, you are always welcome. Yes, please come and join us, worship with us. We want to remind you today, follow the shepherd. Don't follow the sheep. Follow Jesus. There is hope for you. Just follow the shepherd's lead. There is hope for you. He will supply your every need. There is hope for you if you his voice obey and heed. There is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you. Do not become a goat at heart. There is hope for you. From their example you must depart. There is hope for you. Follow the Good Shepherd from the start, because there is hope in Christ for you. Yes, friend, there is hope for you. Let's pray as we end our study today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you to know that you do have a true church, a fold on earth. We want to be your sheep, following Jesus, the Good Shepherd, we pray for our viewers that are not yet part of your one true fold. As they've been convicted, many of them, to become Seventh-day Adventists, bless them in this step as they prepare for that. We want to be faithful in following Jesus. So help us, each of us, to do that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We invite you to join us again for number 30. What will heaven be like? That's going to be an amazing study, right, son? Yes, it will. One of our favorites. What will, join us again next time for What Will Heaven Be Like? We want to remind you on behalf of the Hope Channel and Amazing Facts, there, there is, is hope, hope for you. For you.